An infection from exposure to dog urine that can cause high fevers, reddened eyes, muscle aches and pains, meningitis, and even death in some rare cases? Yes, that is leptospirosis. So leptospirosis is a bacterial infection caused by leptospira species. So there have been more than 20 species of this particular bacteria that have been identified, but the most common cause of leptospirosis is the species Leptospira interrogans. So these particular bacteria are going to be what we call spirochete bacteria. So spirochete bacteria are these twirly bacteria, and they're going to be gram-negative and obligate aerobes, meaning that they require oxygen to live and grow. Now, as mentioned before, these are going to be transmitted to humans via contaminated water. We're going to discuss that when we talk about the pathophysiology in the next slide. And leptospirosis is the most common zoonotic infection globally. Zoonotic means that it comes from animals, and it's estimated that there are 1 million cases of leptospirosis annually, and 60,000 deaths are attributed to leptospirosis that occur annually as well. Leptospirosis is also associated with other zoonotic diseases like dengue fever and malaria. And because of where this bacteria is located in the world, and also because it can be transmitted via contaminated water, there are certain high-risk groups that are more likely to get infected with this particular bacteria. Some of these include surfers, agriculturalists, so anybody working in agriculture dealing with contaminated water, especially in places where there are less sanitary protocols. And this has actually been one group of people in the world that have seen an increase in cases of leptospirosis. And also we can see it more commonly in sewer workers, again, because of exposure to contaminated water. Now, leptospirosis is going to occur more commonly in tropical locales. So we can see it in the tropics and this includes Hawaii. So Hawaii is also a place that we can get this particular bacteria. So how do individuals get infected with leptospira interrogans? So as mentioned before, it can come from contaminated dog urine, but it can also come from other animals as well, including farm animals like cows, pigs, horses. We can get it again from domesticated dogs. We can get it also from raccoons and porcupines. So what happens is when these animals urinate into the environment, this bacteria is in their urine. So the bacteria can enter into the environment, can get into water and soil. So we can get it from soil as well. This is going to be less common. Once it gets into water and soil, it can actually survive in water for up to 16 days without a new host. And soil can last for up to 24 days. So again, we can often get infection most of the time from contaminated water, but we could also get it from exposure literally to the animal urine. This would be a more or higher risk of getting infected. Or we can also get it from contaminated soil, although less common. And then what's going to happen is it's going to enter into non-intact skin. So if you didn't have any scratches or any broken skin, you're not going to get infected. It has to be in a place where you've had broken skin or a cut, something that has disrupted the epithelial barrier. We can also get it in the mucous membranes, though. This is another important way that this can be transmitted. So mucous membranes include the nose, the eyes, and the mouth. So if you get splashed in the face with water, for instance, and get it some in your eyes, that can lead to infection with this bacteria. Once the bacteria enter into the body, they can go into lymphatics and then ultimately into the bloodstream, travel through the bloodstream, and then they have a predilection for residing in the liver and the kidneys, and they can even get into the central nervous system or the CSF the cerebral spinal fluid. We'll talk about that when we talk about some of the more severe complications of this condition. Once an individual has become infected with this bacteria, if they enter in through broken skin or enter in through one of those mucous membranes we talked about before, they get into the bloodstream, it takes about one to four weeks before they're going to start seeing symptoms. So that's the incubation period from the time when bacteria enter into your system to when you start to have signs and symptoms. So on average, one to four weeks, we can see it as early as two days in some cases. So when individuals become infected, they start to develop symptoms, they're going to have a particular pattern of symptoms. So it's going to occur in a biphasic manner. It's not going to occur in biphasic manner in every case, but we can see this occurring in some cases. So biphasic meaning that there is an increase in symptoms, and then there's a peaking of symptoms, and then there's a lulling, there's a decrease in symptoms, and then another group of symptoms or some similar symptoms will start to re-emerge again, peak, and then start to resolve again. So it can occur in a biphasic way. So the first phase is what we call the acute or septicemic phase. So this is when the bacteria are in the bloodstream, and then we can then get the second phase, which is the immune or inflammatory phase. This is when the immune system starts to develop antibodies to the bacteria, and this can cause 
other symptoms that can occur, and some can be quite severe. We'll talk about that here in a moment. So the first phase, this acute septicemic phase, is going to occur in the first week of infection. And then if patients do get the second phase, not all patients will, but if they do, they can get it in the second week. So there'll be a peaking of symptoms and there'll be a resolution by the end of the week. Then there'll be some picking up of new symptoms or some similar symptoms that increase in severity then start to resolve later. So let's talk about those signs and symptoms. A lot of the signs and symptoms are going to be flu-like, especially at first. We can get a sudden onset of a fever, generally from 38 to 40 degrees Celsius. With the fever, we can get rigors. This is chill, so patients can become very shaky and they can have rigors. Patients can also get a headache. And they can also get retroorbital pain. So retroorbital pain is pain behind the eyes. So this is going to be a key point with regards to this particular infection. We can see retroorbital pain in leptospirosis. And similarly, we can see retroorbital pain in dengue fever infections as well. So we don't see retroorbital pain in a lot of infections, but we can see it in these two infections. Now, we can also get a non-productive cough. There can be nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea in some patients. And then Some other important findings can include myalgias. Myalgias are muscle aches and pains. And especially, and more key with regards to leptospirosis, is that there's going to be myalgias of calf muscles. So the gastrocnemius muscle, the calf muscle, can become very achy. So this is a very interesting and important finding in leptospirosis. We can also see, interestingly, back pain or lumbar pain. So lower back pain can also occur in leptospirosis as well. Another key finding. Photophobia can also occur. Photophobia is a sensitivity to light. There can be what we call conjunctival suffusion. So eyes can become reddened, and there can be what we call hyperemia of conjunctival vessels with chemosis. And chemosis is going to be a swelling or edema of the conjunctiva. So it kind of looks a little bit puffy in some cases. So this is a particular infection that can cause chemosis, along with that hyperemia of conjunctival vessels. We can also get, in some more rare cases, acute pancreatitis, so inflammation of the pancreas. And then in individuals who are pregnant, if they get infected with leptospira and pterygans, this particular bacteria can cross the placenta and then can cause miscarriage and stillbirth, especially in the first two trimesters. And because of some of the findings we talked about, including and especially the high fever and the retroorbital pain, this can be mistaken for dengue fever. So those particular symptoms can start to become better. They can start to lull And then in some patients, they can have that second phase, that immune phase. So they start to have other symptoms picking up again. So they can start to have a recurrent fever. So they could have had that fever, and then the fever starts to get better. And then all of a sudden, it starts to get worse again in the second week. That's the recurrent fever. This can occur in some patients. Uveitis can occur in this second phase, in this immune phase. And so uveitis is an inflammation of the uvea, and this can cause blurring of vision as well. We can also see a skin rash in this particular phase. And we can also get meningitis-like symptoms. So meningitis is going to have fever, stiff neck. If we were to do certain clinical tests, like Brzezinski sign and Kerning sign, we can see positive tests there. So if you want more information, please check out my lesson on meningitis. And then in this particular second phase, we can get a more severe presentation of leptospirosis, which is called wheel disease. So wheel disease is also known as icterohemorrhagic leptospirosis. We'll talk about what these particular terms mean here in a moment. So essentially, wheel disease or icterohemorrhagic leptospirosis is a more severe form of leptospirosis. It's going to occur in that second phase, and it's going to occur in roughly 10% of patients. So 90% of patients will have those more mild symptoms we talked about before in that first phase, but there's going to be a smaller percentage that's going to get this particular variant, roughly 10% or less. So some of the findings we can see in wheel disease include liver dysfunction. So with regards to the liver dysfunction, we can start to get scleral icterus, a yellowing of the whites of the eyes, and jaundice, a yellowing of the skin. So icterus, we can see this similarly in this prefix ictero. We can also get kidney dysfunction as well. So we can get renal failure in some patients, oliguria. So oliguria is going to be very small volumes of urine produced. And then azotemia. This is where there is high levels of nitrogen compounds in the blood because the kidneys are not filtering properly. We talked about the fact that these bacteria like to enter into the liver in the kidneys. This is why we can see in some patients 
liver dysfunction and kidney dysfunction leading to wheel disease. We can also again see fever, and we can also see hemorrhage. This is going to be key here as well. This adds up to the name icterohemorrhagic. So hemorrhage is going to occur from generally thrombocytopenia. So there's going to be low platelet counts. We can get hemorrhage from many different parts of the body. We can get melina in some cases, black, tarry, smelly stool. We can get hematochesia, which is bright red blood in your stool. We can get pulmonary hemorrhages, and we can also get subconjunctival hemorrhages as well. So bleeding in the subjunctival space. We can also get anemia, so low hemoglobin level or low red blood cell count. And then there may be some cardiac involvement in some patients. And then there can ultimately be systemic inflammatory syndrome and shock. So this is, can be where patients can have higher morbidity and mortality here. So this is what can often cause a lot of those deaths we talked about before. How is this condition diagnosed by clinicians? So it's important to rule out dengue fever. So because there can be some overlap in symptoms, we want to rule out dengue fever. So assess for dengue fever, you want to look for anti-dengue IgM and do a PCR. Once you've ruled out dengue fever, then you can look for anti-leptospira IgM antibodies. You can do DNA PCR of body fluids like the blood, the cerebral spinal fluid, and the urine. We can also do leptospira cultures in the same bodily fluids. What's a very important diagnostic test for leptospirosis is microscopic agglutination testing. If we get a single titer that is greater than or equal to one to 200, or there is a four-fold rise in between the first and fourth week of illness, that is enough to make the diagnosis. Other blood work include CBC lights, creatinine, PT, PTT, and INR, ALT, and AST. So CBC is a complete blood count. We talked about the fact that there's thrombocytopenia, low platelet count, there's anemia, low hemoglobin level. We want to look at electrolytes because of the fact that we want to make sure that they don't have kidney dysfunction, and also the same reason for creatinine. PT, PTT, and INR for hemorrhage, and we want to make sure that their clotting is working properly, and then ALT and AST for liver dysfunction. CSF analysis can be important, especially if we have concern of meningitis. And then imaging is going to involve chest radiography if there's any worry of pulmonary hemorrhage, biliary tract ultrasonography, especially in wheel disease if we're wanting to assess for any other causes of jaundice especially too, and then electrocardiography as well for checking to make sure that the heart is okay. How do clinicians treat this condition? So in mild cases, and some of those symptoms we talked about before in the first phase, antibiotics can be important, so we can get doxycycline. Doxycycline is going to be a key treatment. This is going to be the treatment for mild cases of leptospirosis. Alternative antibiotics can include ampicillin, amoxicillin, and macrolides like azithromycin and clarithromycin. And then in severe cases, hospitalization is going to be required, and then patients will be put on IV antibiotics. So IV penicillin G is going to be the first line, and then alternatives could be IV ceftriaxone. So these are the antibiotics to use to treat leptospirosis. And then on top of all of this, because leptospirosis is a spirochete bacteria, Using antibiotics to treat it can lead to a particular reaction called the gerrish herxheimer reaction. If you want more information, please check my lesson on that topic. But what can happen is that even after you start to treat patients, and perhaps they start to feel better, because the antibiotics are destroying the spirochete bacteria, there's a release of certain compounds in the blood. And then there's an immune response to those compounds that can lead to fever, chills, malaise, and flu-like symptoms again. That's the gerrish herxheimer reaction. And again, if you want more information, please check my lesson on that topic. Please check my other infectious disease lessons in my infectious disease playlist. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And also please consider joining as a member for members only content. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.